to thank you on behalf of our sponsors, uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation, Big T Fly Fishing, and Soqui River Outfitters. We want to welcome you to tonight's webinar about fly fishing, the North Fork of the French Broad River watershed, as described in Sam's book, Fly Fishing the Blue Ridge Parkway. This is the, uh, the fourth installation in, in a total of about six webinars over the coming months, each featuring a different watershed covered in the book. And then the final session in May will be all about uh, custom fine made bamboo uh, fly rods. As far as fly fishing goes, uh, Sam is a charter member, past president and current board member of TU's Gold Rush chapter. Has fished the waters in North Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, uh, all sorts of places in the western part of the U.S. Has a special fondness for the uh, Rockies, Cascades, and Sierras. He's the author of the first-in-class book, Fly Fishing the Blue Ridge Parkway, the first part, which is the North Carolina section. He'll tell you more about that. He's also a freelance writer for American Fly Fishing Magazine. And specifically, the September-October 2020 issue has a great article on Courthouse Creek in Western North Carolina. So I encourage you to check that out. He's also a member of the Outdoor Writers Association of America, Georgia Outdoor Writers Association, uh, has been building custom bamboo fly rods for over 25 years and has built rods for L.L. Bean out of Maine, Wright and McGill in Denver, and dozens of anglers and collectors worldwide. And when he's not uh, fishing or thinking about fishing or writing about fishing in his free time. He's actually uh, an equity partner in Atlanta's uh, in Atlanta practice of Newport LLC, talking about mergers and acquisition and advisory. He sits on several large corporate boards uh, advising clients in a variety of industries. He's also a co-owner of um, Wild Bearings LLC that markets a wide variety of unique and, and great outdoor goods and items. Graduated from the University of Southern Mississippi, where he was on a four-year football scholarship and played under Coach Mac Brown, past game directors for the Grandfather Mountain Highland Games, and has also been a bagpiper for over 20 years. So if, if he hasn't done it, I'm sure he's, he's fixing to. So with that, Sam, the first year is my friend. Wow, what an intro. Th thanks, uh, Jason. I really appreciate all your help in, in, in putting this webinar on and the ones before. Uh, you've been a great help, and it's much appreciated. And I'd certainly be remiss if I didn't if I didn't also throw a shout out to the folks over at the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation. Um, uh, Carolyn Ward, the CEO of that of that organization, and her team just do a great job in supporting the Blue Ridge Parkway. And really, you know. It, it, in part and parcel, that's really what this program is about tonight. Uh, it's, it's about the, the North Fork of the French Broad River, but it's, it's also about the Blue Ridge Parkway. And Carolyn and her team, they are the Parkway's primary fundraising partner. They're critically important in helping them put together educational programs and build and repair trails and programming and youth programming and awareness and things like that. They just do a great job and I appreciate their their support of this of this series that we're doing. Um, and also uh, to Stephen uh, out at Big T Fly Fishing and Sequoia River Outfitters in Clarksville, Georgia. Big T Fly Fishing uh, is, a, is a great online fly shop. Um, great for fly tires, uh, great fly lines, Euro Nip, and, and also Sequoia River Outfitters uh, the, on, on the famous quintessential trout stream in Georgia, the Sequoia. Uh, they guide on that and have a brick and mortar uh, facility in Clarksville also. Um, if, for tonight only, um, if you're interested, if you go to one of their sites, if you go to their sites, either Big T Fly Fishing or to um, Sequoia River Outfitters and punch in Broad 10, that's B-R-O-A-D 10, as in French Broad 10, uh, you get a 10 off store-wide. Anything in the store you find you want, you get 10 off of that. So anyway, okay, that's enough promotion there. Uh, let's talk about fly fishing. And uh, specifically, we're, we're going to get to the, the North Fork of the French Broad River but you're you're looking at a at a at a at an image here um, that dates back about 15 years to to a, a waterfall in Western Carolina that I'm sure the majority of you probably recognize. This is Looking Glass Falls, and I get emails, I get 
phone calls, text, smoke signals, all the time people saying, man, what is your obsession with this looking glass waterfall? And the obsession is this. Uh, I grew up in the southern part of Alabama and looking glass falls was the very first waterfall that I ever saw as a seven-year-old kid. And it made such an impression on me that a few years later, when I came back and cast my first fly rod uh, into that pool and caught a bit of little seven or eight inch rainbow trout, it made such such an impression on me that I've never forgotten it. And I kind of compare myself to the a salmon swimming upstream to where, you know, it, the spawning took place. And I do that every year. So now I do it a lot because I live up in this area and I come to that area quite a bit, but I used it on the front of this book and I it, it is a special place. And that brings up another topic that I know is near and dear to, to many of your hearts. It is to mine too. And it's this topic, this buzzword this, that got put into practice a few years ago called hot spotting. And I have been accused of hot spotting from when this book was published a week later to every time I do a webinar, I'm accused by some people of hot spotting. And um, I just don't see it that way. And I, I respectfully say that. Um, I love these places as much as you do. And my book, if anything, it is a leave no trace uh, testament to to being in the outdoors and being around these beautiful remote outback places that you go to and you leave them exactly the way you found them. And that's what I, I believe in. Um, when I talk about a watershed, like I'm going to talk about tonight, when I talk about the North Fork, I'm going to be talking about a 30,000 acre watershed. I'm not going to be talking about one water, one pool to go throw a number 14 caddis in with a with a number uh, 18 beadhead prints dropped, you know, 24 inches underneath it under 6x tippet line. I'm not going to tell you that. You got to figure that out yourself. But I'm going to tell you about the watershed and I'm going to tell you about what a special place it is. And quite frankly, nearly all of these watersheds that I talk about, you could you could cut and paste them all up and down the Appalachian chain, especially in the National Park and in the National Forest Service, there are so many great watersheds. Uh, I could never write about them. I write about close to 200 of them in this book, but I'm just scratching the surface. There, there are some really great places to fish. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you about the watershed, but I'm not going to tell you how to fish it, and I'm not going to tell you what to fish with, and I'm not going to tell you exactly where to go fish. I'm just going to tell you in general about the watershed and why it's such a neat place. So, um, having said that, um, let me give you just a quick overview of, of this book. Uh, we call it a first-in-class book because it is the, ver the first book written about fly fishing the Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a friend, uh, Mark Woods, who was superintendent of the Blue Ridge Parkway, who forwarded this book. And he's just, um, he retired a few years ago um, and was, was superintendent during some of the most difficult times of the parkway, at least in the last probably 40 or 50 years. But, but Mark and his wife, Jenny, live, live up in uh, Kentucky, have a place in uh, Waynesville that they spend a lot of time in. And he's just a super guy and um, big hiker. And I'm trying to turn him into even a more of a fisherman, but he's, he's a super guy and I appreciate his help. Um, the book is 308 pages, um, color photography, digital photography, uh, about 145 images, uh, a lot of parkway history. Uh, I do talk about the trout, Brook Brown and Rainbow specifically, probably a lot, probably more than you even want to read about the genealogy and where they came from and the ones that came from Scotland, where did they come from from Scotland? The ones that came from Germany, where did they come from? How did they get over here? You know, what form did they come in and, and how did they get distributed to where they are, the way they are now? Uh, there's probably more than you want. I talk a lot about the, the, the hydrology and then I break, I break it into four 63 mile sections. Uh, and then I divide the rivers and streams up within each of those sections. And then that way there's an organized way of looking at the water up and down the parkway. Uh, I provide descriptions and access detail, uh, uh, a lot of history and stories and lore, uh, both things that I've come across and people have told me um, wh where the lodging food and breweries are as far as outfitters. 
and and also something that's you know I I I, I do walk the walk. Um, I don't just talk the talk, but you know this book is you're not you're not going to make money writing books about fly fishing. I can promise you that. But what you can do, uh, because of the way the tax laws work, you, you can give money to nonprofit and, and help them. And that's that's I've dedicated a large portion of the of the net profits to this book to the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation because I believe in their mission and I know how important they are to the Blue Ridge Parkway. So that's a little bit about the book. I get asked, what do you fish with? Uh, everybody wants to know, you write books? I think, well you, must, well, you must fish with something, you know, fancy. Not really. I fish with a 20-year-old bamboo rod I made off the shop floor, made off the scraps off the shop floor. Uh, this was a rod I couldn't have sold anybody. So uh, we put it together with the scraps. It's an F.E. Thomas seven foot four weight taper. Um, it's just one of the sweetest casting little dry fly rides you'd ever you'd ever you'd ever use. And it works really well on all of these Appalachian streams down here, and including I fish it even on the on the Holston and the Watauga River, you know, chasing 18 and 20 inch trout. And it does fine with that. So I'm not a technical fisherman like a lot of you are. Uh, I promise you the majority of you are, are better fisher people than I am. Uh, I just, I just, I just stay after it until I bug the fish into biting, but I do feel like fishing with bamboo. Um, this, this was a Nephi Thomas taper, the Lacey and Johnson built, and it's just, I've really enjoyed it. Um, now let me, let's start talking about water. And I'm going to run through the, the, the four sections in North Car on the, along the North Carolina Parkway section of the parkway, the 252 miles of, of parkway. I'm going to give you the four sections and kind of how they, how they laid out. Section one, uh, which is actually the end of the parkway, for, that's the 469th mile is right there. Um, I actually start there and go north, um, and the parkway starts there in Cherokee, curves down between Waynesville and Cullowee and Silva, back around, you know, Bavard and below Waynesville and up around right below Mount Pisgah under Asheville at a place on the parkway called Buck Springs. And I, I could talk for, I could talk the rest of the night about what a special place this is, but I won't. Uh, Big Creek, um, um, actually heads up right there, right to the, to the east of that. I do write about it in the book. It is quite a place. So that 62 mile section, you can see some of the waters, uh, some of the major waters. Um, this area highlighted here is the area we're going to be talking about tonight. And this is the, this is the, the North Fork of the French Broad River coming off the parkway, uh, right under Devil's Courthouse. And now, if you pick up at Buck Springs and go north, the second section picks up there, runs up right through Asheville, right to the south side of, of Mount Mitchell, little down and then back up to just past Spruce Pine, where Highway 80 crosses. And it stops there for that 63 miles. You got the South Tow River. You got, you got all kind of great creeks uh, coming in here. Curtis Creek, some really special water along that section. That's a very high section, by the way. Um, section three picks up at Highway 80, runs through Spruce Pine, Linville, Blowing Rock, and up to E.B. Jeffrey State Park. This is Wilson Creek, Linville River, uh, Watauga River. You've got a bunch of great water, great watersheds off of this area also. And then the section four picks up at E.B. Jeffrey State Park and runs 62 miles up to the North Carolina Virginia line, just below Galax, Virginia, and and this is uh, last month I I talked about uh, Bullhead Creek, which was right here in Stone Mountain State Park. And this is a really cool area to fish. It's just one great trout stream after the other. Let's let's take a couple of minutes and let's talk about the the watershed for the North Fork of the French Broad and what's going on there. And I'm gonna give you just a little bit of kind of Parkway, uh, North Fork River overview and history of this 30,000 acres. To the south, you've got Highway 64, which is coming out of Toxaway and that area coming north, northeast up into Brevard. 
that kind of that kind of kind of provides the the southern boundary. Up on top up here, you've got the Blue Ridge Parkway. This red line runs along the top up here, and that provo that that provides the northern boundary. Just just beyond that, you've got um, you, you've got um, the Shining Rock Wilderness, Middle Prong Wilderness, and just a, a a lot of water over on the other side of that also. And so there's that's kind of and here here's what the water looks like. This is the if I were just to, to paint the river and its tributaries, I'm not going to name the tributaries yet because I'm going to show them to you one at a time. Uh, but that's this, the water runs almost perfectly up and down Highway 215 that starts at Rossman here and runs all the way up this watershed, all except the last mile and a half of it right here. And then it continues on up to the Blue Ridge Parkway, over the parkway or under the parkway, on in next to the, the West Fork of the Pigeon River, and runs right down between the Middle Prong Wilderness and, and um, Shining Rock Wilderness. It, it itself is an amazing place to fish. We'll talk about that some other time. But this is what the watershed looks like. We're going to start here in a few minutes and work our way up the river into the six sections that I've broken it into. But there's a place here that I want to I want to talk with you about first, some of the history. That, that's kind of an interesting area here that I found by mistake. And I, for lack of a better word, this little area, better name, I call it Area 51. Because I was fishing along here one day and um, decided to take out of the stream. And I I rode up the road about a, about a, about a half a mile and turned into this parking lot that had all kind of security posts and, and fences, concertina wire, search lights and everything, but the gate was open. And so dummy me, I just go driving through the gate and before long, I'm in a place like this. And I'd just gotten off a trout stream. And remember, I, I'm in the middle of Pisgah National Forest who knows that something like this is within a, just a stone's throw of one of the great trout streams of the area. And so, uh, you know, here I am wandering around this place of these great, you know, 10 and 15 meter dishes looking up into the sky uh, with these big administrative buildings, no windows. And within a, about three minutes, a big black superb, suburban had pulled up next to me and the guy uh, encouraged me to follow him to the gate. And he was not friendly. He did not talk nice to me. And uh, he looked he looked like he was serious. So I followed him to the gate and he basically escorted me off the property. But having said that, I got curious as to what this was all about because he wouldn't answer any of my questions for some reason. And this building you're looking at, I'm only showing you half of this building. It's huge. No windows, satellite dishes all over the place. But what you're looking at here is something that was built back in um, the early 60s by NASA, the Defense Department, NSA, and who, who knows el who else was involved in this. But they got into this dark area of the Appalachian Mountains where there was very little electronic signals coming in here. And they put in these, they put in a satellite farm, satellite dish farm to follow our satellites and our spacecraft, our manned spacecraft flights. But they were also there to, 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 to sur surveil uh, Russian satellites that would come over. And so occasionally the Russian satellites would come over and take images. And they actually, on, in the middle of one of these dishes, they painted a smiley face that you could see from 150 miles out in space. I guess they thought that was kind of funny. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, this is one of the interesting places along uh, uh, the North Fork of the French Broad River that if you hadn't seen this, I would encourage you to drive up there and, and take a look at it. You can see the majority of it. Um, there's something else that's really interesting about this, this area, uh, and it's called Devil's Courthouse. Devil's Courthouse, um, is really the headwaters. It forms the headwaters of the North Fork of the French Broad Rivers, where Courthouse Creek and Kissimmee 
I believe Creek comes off. I never do pronounce that correct. But this is about 55, 5,600 feet above, 5,700 feet above sea level. So it is, it is a dominating landmark as you come down the Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, it's about, about three or 400 feet above the parkway. Parkway runs behind it over here, but it's a, it's a beautiful place. And all the way down this watershed, when you get in a clear area that you can look to the north, you can see uh, Devil's Courthouse. And I, I make the point in the book that long before Charlie Daniels went down, uh, wrote about the devil going down to Alabama to steal some souls, uh, he was actually holding court um, off the Blue Ridge Parkway at a place called Devil's Courthouse. And this is Devil's Courthouse Tunnel, a very famous tunnel that was completed. I don't think this was completed until sometime in the 50s, I believe, was when this one was finally completed. Um, but it's just a, it's a great landmark and a great place to go see. And every time you're on the North Fork of the French Broad, the water that you're standing in is coming off this watershed right there. Um, the last, the last landmark that I'll, I'll tell you about is the highway itself. Um, highway 215 starts down here at Rossman, um, tees off on Highway 64, and it parallels the river all the way up, except this one area right here where the river gets about six, about six tenths of a mile from it. Um, and it's so for 12.7 miles, it runs all the way up to this point right here, and then it continues on up to the parkway. So as far as access to the water, you're always close to the water with this road. That does not mean that it's gonna be easy to get on the water from this road, because you may be standing on, your, on the road in the back of your truck, putting on your, putting on your waders, but you may be five or 600 feet above the water. <laughs> Now, there, there, there are ways to get around that, and we'll talk about it, um, but um, it's just a great road, and even better, as I mentioned, when it goes under the parkway, it continues on into Shining Rock Wilderness and Middle Prong Wilderness and parallels the West Fork of the Pigeon River, which is, in every sense of the word, one of the most beautiful rivers in the Southeast, in my opinion. So it's a great drive from Rossman north up to Waynesville um, using uh, Highway 215. Great ride. Okay, so that's all the, the area information I'm going to give you. Um, that's great road, but let's, let's talk now about the North Fork of the French Broad River. Um, in the book, each of the watersheds, I kind of have my score sheet that, that I put on uh, and, and this is the score sheet for the North Fork. I give it a five thumbs up. And, and that's the highest that I can give a stream because you have lots of great fish on here. You have all three species. You've got uh, seclusion. You've got look places where you'll have no pressure. You've got places where you can step out of your, your vehicle into the water and catch fish. You've got other places where you have to rappel down the side of a mountain and climb over Volkswagen sized boulders up and down the stream in order to, to fish it. So you've got assisted living fishing and you've got, you know, take your life in your own hands, you know, heart pounding, rappel down the side of the mountain fishing also. The size of, of this river as it goes into uh, to foot, to, as it joins the West Fork of the of the uh, French Broad and forms the French Broad proper, it's pretty large. There, it's about I would say ten, in some cases fifteen yards across at the confluence with the West Fork. The great thing about this stream or river is that the gradient is very low. It's about one point five percent which is extremely low over the 12.7 miles. It only loses a thousand feet in elevation from the mouth to the source or, or from the source to the mouth, which is pretty, pretty, pretty reasonable. The effort that it takes to fish it, I've got it divided into, into six sections. Section one and two are easy. Section three and four are difficult, and I'll explain why. Section five is very easy if you can find areas to fish in there, a lot of private water there. And section six, as you get back up in the National Forest, uh, can be moderate to difficult. Uh, the pressure 
kind of goes in line with as with those efforts there. Uh, the places that are hard to fish, you're going to have none to slight. You may not see some see someone fishing anywhere near you the entire day you're there, but you get down in section one or two, you're going to see some people around you. It's, it's just about like everywhere else. So the fishing quality, um, the experience, I have good to excellent in all the sections just because of all the reasons we mentioned. And you're going to have all three species of salmonoids there, um, rainbows, browns, and, and brookies to, to a minimal extent in some of the high, high elevation streams. Um, let's look at the, the river uh, kind of take it apart and let me give you some of the details of the river and I'm going to start up here with the headwaters and just let it flow all the way down and then I'm going to come back up to the headwaters up here you have two headwater creeks here you got one is 2.7 miles long that comes off just to the to the northeast of Devil's Courthouse and then you've got Courthouse Creek is three and 3.1 miles long that comes off just to the west of Devil's Courthouse. And they come down here and, and come together and form um, the last mile and a half of the, of the headwaters of the North Fork of the French Broad River as it flows down to Highway 215. And it comes in right there with, with Beechery Fork, which is its first really, I consider, fishable tributary, uh, comes in right there, which is a great fishing stream that I, one of my favorites also. I'll talk about it later. But uh, this is section six. And then section five goes from here uh, down all the way to this area right down here through Balsam Road, about uh, 5.7 miles flows down into that area there. Um, and so this is through civilization here. A lot of private property, a lot of homes that you'll see, some pretty interesting places there, some magnificent waterfalls right by the road. You're within a stone's throw of the river anywhere along this stretch here from Highway 215, literally. Uh, so that's section five. Uh, section four starts right here um, and flows down, comes into section three, which goes down to right here. These are, are two extremely rugged sections that takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to fish. I do not recommend fishing these sections by yourself. There's not a lot of good trails in there. It's extremely rugged. The stream can get particularly mean in there. And, um, and I would, if I were you, and do what I did, go down and find you a guide and buy a day or two days of a, of a guide and let them take you in there and show you that part of the river properly uh, and safely. But it is a great, you, you might as well be a thousand miles from nowhere when you're down in that, in that gorge. And I'll show you some pictures of it in just a few minutes. As you get to the bottom of section three here, section two picks up, it gets very flat. Go down here to the, uh, the campgrounds, section one picks up and goes all the way down here to Highway 64 uh, and to the confluence of the West Fork and the formation of the, the, the French Broad River proper, which flows on down, goes through these farmlands, slows down, gets muddy, and flows further north a couple of hundred miles up into Tennessee. But that's the kind of the that's kind of the DNA of what. Um, the North Fork of the French Broad River looks like from the headwaters. You only have, in my opinion, now there are people who would take, take issue with what I'm going to say here, but for the type of fishing that I do, there's only, there's only about five, maybe six tributaries along this entire 12.7 mile run, including the headwaters, that I consider not just fishable, but fun to fish. There's a lot of really tiny little creeks that come in that you can fish a hundred or two yards up and catch, you know, six and eight inch uh, rainbows maybe. Uh, but uh, you start down here with Long Branch, uh, which is in section which is in section three uh, that I'll show you. Uh, this is this is a, a, a nominal 
branch right here that I fished about a, about three quarters of a mile up. You got Tucker Creek uh, that really of the 4.5 miles of this creek, only about a mile and a half of it is what I consider really decent fishing. The rest of it's been trashed to the point that I don't even like to be around it. Um, and then as you get a little higher, you get up into Bee Tree Fork. Uh, I'll show you some images of that. And then the two headwater creeks, uh, which are two very high elevation creeks, small fish. It's just where you're probably going to find your brook trout and, and some rainbow trout up in that area right there. That's typically where I'll find them. But but that's that's about, you know, what um, what what these areas look like right here. Now, I'm going to go back downstream uh, to the intersection at, at Highway 64 and 215 at the start of Section 1 in section two here and give you an idea of kind of what it looks like is you might be able to tell you see some grasslands here some pastures there's some cow pastures and horses running around here this is pretty civilized in this section right here um so you're, you're gonna it's pretty it's very flat as i'll show you uh not a lot of in-stream obstruction for the fish to hang around uh, it's, the, the, it's wide along here, anywhere from, you know, uh, 10, 15 yards wide. If you come back down here to the intersection, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, this is 64. This is 215. Here's the North Fork coming in. Here's the West Fork flowing in from under this bridge. And right here, as, it, as the North Fork comes underneath the Highway 64 bridge and meets the West Fork of the French Broad, that is the official start of the French Broad River. Now there are two other headwaters that join the French Broad about a quarter or half mile downstream. You got the East Fork of the French Broad and then you got the Middle Fork, a really small creek that comes in. So technically you have four headwaters that form the French Broad River system, but these two are the first two that come together where the French Broad is actually, you'll find it on a map. Um, so that's kind of the way that works. Uh, here's the area where they, where they come together. Here's the West Fort coming in from the south. Here's the North Fort coming in from the north from under the bridge. You can see this deep hole right here where, they, where the confluence is, and then it flows south, or excuse me, north, flowing north here, uh, which brings up a the question is, well, what you know, what, what 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 is this French Broad business going on here? Uh, how did the French Broad get its name? Well, I I was raised, I, I was brought up and told by some of the locals in Brevard and Hendersonville that the French Broad was named after a French Broad who, settler woman who had an outpost uh, who actually ran a business and. Um, but anyway, supposedly that's how the river got its name, but that's what true. The, the, the official account is this, is that the two largest, broadest rivers in Western Carolina, there are two, and they're very close together at this point. Where this stream that we're looking at um, flowed north up into the French territory. So the settlers in this area called it the French Broad because it flowed north. Well, not far from here, there's another great big river, a very broad river that flowed to the south into English territory. And it was called the English Broad. Well, over time, the English Broad name got dropped, but the French Broad name, for some reason, hung on and we still use it today. So that's probably all the trivia you want to know. Um, but uh, that's how the French Broad River supposedly got its name. Above the, um, above the bridge, uh, headed north, this is the, the, the section one, a lot of what it looks like. It is, it is, it is broad, it is, it is wide, it is flat, it is, um, it's got, a, it's got a, a lot of, of grass cover on the side, uh, dog hobble, you got some trees on this side, provide some good shade. It's really uh, for the first 1.8 miles of this up to uh, the Lazy J campgrounds. Um, 
this is what it is this what it'll look like and these are typical the little rainbows this is i guess a little eight or nine inch rainbow that you'll see typical there there's only one creek that comes in uh below lazy j it's called diamond creek and it's mostly up through private land uh it's fishable uh marginally fishable uh, but it's, it's, I've not asked the people along there to fish it, so I haven't fished it. Uh, knock yourself out if you go up there. Um, at 1.8 miles up, you come to Lazy J Campgrounds, which is there's a bridge across the river, a big metal bridge goes across. And from that point, just north of there is where the National Forest Service sign is. And, you, and that, is the, that, is, that is the start of section two and it goes for one mile up to a place called bear wallow creek and the creek along here is pretty open this is kind of kind of you know what what you'll see this little brown trout um typical that you'll see along there the creek is is open uh don't be fooled because the road can be probably 40 yards up here at a 45 degree angle. So you have to pick your way down. It's easier to put in at the campgrounds or at the Forest Service sign and fish the mile up to Bear Wallow Creek and then take out, then trying to climb out of there and get back up on the road level. Because I can tell you from experience, it'll, it'll bust your chops. Once you get up to Bear Wallow Creek, you're at the start of section three, the gorge. And this goes for 2.2 miles up to this section right here, where I think is Big Mountain Creek um, co com comes out. Yeah, Big Mountain Branch uh, comes out right here, forms a little, a little, a little lake. And uh, this area for, for 2.2 miles, I'm gonna show you some images of this. This can be some of the roughest fishing in the eastern part of the App or the southern part of the Appalachians that I've been able to find. Um, this is where you would put in. Um, there's not a lot of takeouts. Here's the road up here uh, paralleling it. But in some places like along here, you got a vertical climb almost out of, out of this gorge to get out. So if you don't know exactly where you're going, there's not a lot of trails along in here. There, there are no uh, published trails per se on any of the maps uh, that I've used. And so what I do, I, I use a practice called fish through. And so I put in here, I know about how long it will take for me to fish to this point right here. And then I hike up Big Mountain Creek uh, back up to the, uh, to the highway. And then I hitchhike back down to my truck wherever I park. And this, this is a good days worth of fishing right here. This is a hard day's fishing right here to do this. I've camped in here before. Um, I did it by myself when I was a lot younger. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't do that again. I might not camp in there with somebody anymore. I tell you, it's a, it's a spooky place back up in there at night. Uh, but in either event, um, you have one feeder that comes in about roughly, roughly uh, a third of a mile once you put in called Long Branch. This is a small creek. Um, and I fished maybe a half a mile up, up Long Creek and a Long Branch. And uh, it's good little rainbow fishing up in there. Um, as you start up section three, it, 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 it'll lull you to sleep because it's very docile like this. It's just like perfect, you know, wade fishing. And uh, you, you catch a lot of these little boys and girls right here. Uh, very pretty. Uh, a lot of these drop pools that you'll get into. Um, and then what I've done, I've come to the top of the gorge section in, with a satellite image looking down the gorge. Here's the highway, Highway 215 over here. And here's the gorge. And here's the water. Now, the interesting thing Still, from from this is a 150 mile um, ratio here of, of this satellite imagery. From 150 miles up, you're still looking at white water. You can still see the foam from 150 miles away. And so, if this gives you some indication of how rugged 
this gourd section is as you as you wind yourself back down here. Um, don't take it lightly. But for those of you who who like to do this type of outback fishing and can put a little bit of athletic ability into it, I would highly encourage you to do it. Uh, just be careful. And again, pack what you whatever you take in there, take out and leave no trace. Don't let anyone ever know that you've been in there. Uh, leave it the same way for someone else. Um, as you as you continue up uh, out of the gorge area, um, you can see the you can see it's just some real pretty colored fish um, that that you that you get up into this area right here. Um, this section four is 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 what we're coming into here, and this is a satellite imagery drilling down. This is the road. This is, I believe, um, a big mountain branch coming in here. And, and this is a, what I call a natural lake. Um, you got the river coming through here. And all of a sudden, you got this little branch coming in. And it just opens up into a, 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 a half acre lake. The biggest fish that I've caught on this river, I caught in the bottom, dredging out of the bottom of this, what I call, I, I call it Big Mountain uh, Lake. It's not, that's not the name of it. That's just what I call it. But I caught a, um, I think about a 16 or 17 inch brown trout out of the bottom of this um, years ago, just dredging out of the bottom, just on a whim. But um that's what that's what you were looking at right there from 150 miles up. This is where I will take out after fishing the gorge section because when I get to this point, I am worn out and I'm going to hike up this trail up big mountain branch up to the to the highway up here and I'm going to act wounded and I'm going to limp back down here until someone stops and feels sorry for me and picks me up and carries me back down to my truck. And then the next time I fish this section, I'll come and go back down this trail. I'll park here, go down the trail to the lake and start section four. This would be the start of section four. And I'm going to show you that section um, also. Uh, this, is, this is heading into section four. The, the, I've got above the, 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 the lake here, above the, the creek looking down into these runs here looking for fish and then I'll drop down and cast to them. I was sight fishing that particular day. Okay. There's the lake. There's the beginning of section four here that flows all the way up to Macedonia bridge right here. And this is the road. I call this the wilderness section because from here to the road is six tenths of a mile with no trail which means when you get on this section right here and you're going to fish it, you're going to fish from the lake to right here and then bushwhack up to the, to the, to the road. Or if you're going to fish through, um, if, if you don't fish all the way through and take out at Macedonia bridge, then you're going to be bushwhacking across country in an area that's steep as heck with no trails. And so, I, the trick that I found and what I, I learned from some of the local guides in the years past, know where these sections are and know how long it takes to get from here to here, uh, which I do outline in the book and just plan to just do it. Because if you don't, you're going to kill yourself going across. There, there, there's, there's, there's no way to get out of here that I know of. I've seen in satellite images uh, in different seasons, I have seen trails in these trees. I have never found the trails. Uh, but what you can see right here are some big open pond lake areas that, that form in this area. There's one here. There's one here. There's a big one here. And there's another one here, just like this lake down here. And there, there, there's the lake that I just showed you right here. That's what it looks like drilled down satellite imagery. This is a deep, this is probably six or eight feet deep at least. Uh, not a lot of bank to get by it. And then you see on the downhill side here, you got all cobble 
and Riffles running out of here into some really good uh, runs on the bottom side here. So um, just really interesting fishing. It can get very technical and uh, it's the top area. Although you're out of the gorge, you're in a wilderness area. Uh, it's long fishing in there. And there are some literally, there are some rocks that you'll climb over that are big as Volkswagens that you'll, you'll have to climb over to get on up, up the river there in section four. There's 1.8 miles of that. At 1.8 miles ends right down here at the bottom at the Macedonia Church Road. Um, I think that's, that's Highway or, or State Road 1326 is the actual name of that, of that, of that road there. But it, uh, it stops right there. And then from there on up, uh, section, section five goes all the way through Balsam Grove for 5.6 miles. And it is very tame and very docile, all except one area right here where there's a couple of very large waterfalls that I'll show you kind of a special place uh, there. So when you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you go under the bridge here, or if you put in at the bridge to fish this area, I mean, that's what it's going to look like. Now, notice the difference of what we were looking at earlier and what we're looking at now. You're looking at some sand in here now. Well, this sand is coming from all the development upstream, coming out of the farmlands and the pasture lands and the mountain roads that are cut, cutting across between Balsam Grove and, um, and, and, and the other side of Pisgah National Forest uh, around the Davidson River watershed. But it's still some really good runs in there down to Cobble. That, that, that the trout will lay down there in. This is only only a couple of feet deep, very weightable, uh, but that that's that's generally uh, what this area along here and along here will, will look like, will look like that cobble bottom that I showed you. About a quarter of a mile up is the biggest uh, tributary coming into the North Fork of the French Broad. It's called Tucker Creek. And, and Tucker Creek, um, it, it, I mean, th this creek alone is 4.5 miles long up into these farmlands. So some of that siltation and effluence is coming down here uh, through these old, uh, uh, you'll see some old fish hatcheries right here. It gets up, this is non-fishable in my opinion right here, but when you get up into about this next mile and a half up to this area right here, uh, this is fishable. And it's where I fish normally if I fish Tucker Creek. Below here, you've got a lot of trashed area. Um, a, lot of, a lot of dumping has taken place here. But you get up into this higher elevation area here before you get up into this developed area. Uh, this is fish or fishable in, up into here. Um, going back and getting into the main flow of the North Fork of the French Broad in Section 5 and moving up into Balsam Grove. Um, these little brown trout um, ha habitate that area quite a bit. Uh, Tucker Creek that I just mentioned to you, you notice I don't rank it very high. Um, it's medium at the mouth as far as size. Uh, you're not going to have a lot of pressure, and it is easy uh, and uh, moderate as far as the effort that you get, but I just give it fair fishing quality for rainbows and browns. Uh, and although it's four and a half miles long, there's only about a mile and a half of it that I consider, you know, really fishable um, for the type of fishing that I think, you know, you, you probably want to do. Um, th that, that's what um, Tucker Creek looks like as you start heading up into it, uh, into the upper part of it. There's drop pools all up into there, lots of little browns and rainbows. Um, as you come back and get into the main flow of the, the North Fork of the French Broad, there's some pretty special places like this area called Living Waters Retreat. Uh, this is the river. This, there's two, three waterfalls. You, there's two to the left you can't see. This one is coming right by this facility right here that was built many years ago. As a and it's being used now as a as a retreat. It's a, it's a Christian retreat for adults, children, uh, teenagers uh, come here throughout the year for different uh, programming and lessons and everything. And it's a pretty cool place. Um, 
although this entire area is private, is private, uh, you are welcome by the owners to come visit and walk it and enjoy it at your pleasure. As long as you don't, again, um, uh, leave it as you found it. Don't bring anything. Don't drop anything. Don't take anything. <laughs> just come enjoy the beauty because just the architecture is amazing. And um, uh, this is called, I believe, I think the name of this is Cathedral Falls. And um, I never figured it out. I got this big pool right here. People jump in. Um, I never understood why it's Cathedral Falls to one of the owners of the facility said, well, this rock to the left, this rock to the left here goes up probably another 150 feet. It's a huge rock face and it reflects the sound of this waterfall back to the listening area. And it's just a thunderous roar. And so they call it Cathedral Falls. So it's kind of a kind of a cool place to hang out. And I've, I've met, a, met a lot of really nice people there. Um, this is the French Broad flowing through uh, Balsam Grove. This is typically what it looks like. This is this is Highway 215. This is the river, uh, broad and wide, slow and shallow. Uh, but still, according to the locals, it fishes well if you can find some locals that will let you fish along there. This road goes up in the creek here that goes over into the Davidson. You can go from this, you can go from here to the fish hatchery in about 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes on this road right here. Uh, it's a great ride. Uh, not a lot of water up through there once you get off Indian Creek, but um, once you get over the ridge and start heading back down to the Davidson River watershed, you get in some really good water. And then as you get up to the head of this 5.6 mile section, there's a there's a, a fish hatchery up here, very large fish hatchery operation. It's pretty interesting. Uh, my buddy Chris and I have sat there numerous times and watched the fish jump from one pool to the next uh, up the little falls, the little the inlets they've got leading from one. It'll maybe four feet, in some cases five feet. And these six to 10, 12 inch, 15 inch trout you just watch them effortlessly just leap up there. It's just amazing. Looks like looks like what what you'd see out west with salmon. It's a very beautiful place. Um, as you get up to the, the the top of 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 section five, um, you've got section six picks up right here at the bridge on Highway 215 and goes north for 1.2 miles to another bridge where Looking Glass and uh, Kissimmee, that's the creek that comes in and forms the other headwater of the French Broad River. Coming in right there at the bridge is Bee Tree Fork, which is the, the first major tributary coming into the French Broad River. And probably my favorite uh, is Wild it parallels the road here. You rarely see anyone fishing it, especially when it turns away from the road and heads up the side of the mountain. It gets very rugged up in there, but you'll find a lot of brown and rainbows up in there. And most of them have never seen a human being up into that area. Uh, this is just a real, they've had some logging, uh, the National Forest Service doing some, some logging uh, reconstruction operations here. This road last year, um, I haven't been up there um, in several months and the road was open the day I went up there. Uh, but for months toward the end of last year, uh, it was closed because of some damage that had been done. And they had a problem with one of the local contractors that supposedly uh, couldn't fix it in time. So what's the Forest Service do? Well, they just shut the road down. And so I was doing an article on Courthouse Creek uh, for American Fly Fishing Magazine, I said, well, I really need to get up there and take some take some images of Courthouse Creek Falls. And he said, well, he said, Trail 120, 128 uh, will take you up there. Well, what, Trail 128 like starts here and goes around, curves around, it goes for miles and miles, and will just wear yourself totally out till you want to slit your wrist by the time you get where you're going. And so I didn't do that. And I found some stock photos from some friends who are professional photographers who did it. But that was all because of that logging operation right there messed up the road somehow and they shut it down. But it's normally open. And from here 
to here is some of the most beautiful water that you can imagine. Um, Bay Tree 4, I, rate, I rate it a three thumbs up. Uh, it is small at the mouth. Um, the gradient is, is moderate. Uh, it's 11.9, almost 12% grade, which means for roughly every 10 feet you go, you're going to climb two feet. And, and so th that can, that can wear, that can wear on you after a while to ex difficult to extreme at that elevation. Uh, rainbows and brookies are what I've found in this Creek most often. Uh, the road is over to the left. Um, the, uh, the French broad is coming in from the right and this is coming from the top up here. Here's a little rainbow, a uh, little stimulator pattern here, but these are just ubiquitous. Like every drop pool, you pop one of these things in, you're going to, you're going to catch one. Um, it's just beautiful, you know, beautiful water when the sun hits it like that. Um, coming up, uh, far service road 140, which parallels the Creek all the way up to its source. Uh, these, these bridges were blown out several years ago by one of the hurricanes that came up through here and they've rebuilt them now. And they've, and they, they, they did a fabulous job of rebuilding them. And they not only rebuilt them, but they re redesigned the, 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 the river um, uh, substrate coming through that area. Uh, they, they cleaned all the boulders out, stacked them on the side, kind of made it kind of easier to fish through there. So I find it really good fishing around these bridges. So don't pass up the bridges. Uh, fish the wild areas, but get out and fish from about 20 or 30 yards below these bridges to above these bridges. And I think you'll be, you know, you'll, you, you'll, you'll be pleased with what you get there. Um, that's, this is, um, what the creek looks like as you start um, this this is courthouse creek coming in from the northwest area i give it a i give it a four thumbs up uh, i love this creek um, i wouldn't have written about i did write about this last year for american fly fishing magazine one of the feature articles and um, it's just a it's a great stream um, high graded though uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're going to, you're going to gain about 1800 feet over the 3.1 miles. If you fish it up to, to, um, uh, devil's courthouse, uh, moderate to difficult to sometimes extreme. Uh, you're not going to have any pressure unless Chris Sloan sneaks up behind you or something like that, but, but, um, you're not going to have a lot of people, uh, messing with you. Uh, the, the quality, the fishing quality, if you like catching small, you know, wild trout, you know, I mean, I think the fishing is excellent. If you're a trophy trout fisherman, you're not going to like it because you're not going to catch anything probably over about 10 inches and things all the way down to, um, you know, three inches. Uh, this is what these two headwater look like. This is what Courthouse Creek looks like. This is uh, Cassie me Creek, I believe, whatever I pronounce it wrong every time I say it, but it comes down, parallels uh, almost identical flow on the east side of Devil's Courthouse, and then comes in and they connect right here, and then this forms the North Fork of the French Broad River and flows down to, to Highway 215. So you can park right here, or you can take the far service roads and kind of scrunge around up here, and it comes back, it uh, does not go up this creek, but it does come back and parallels about to about right here um, on Courthouse Creek. And so you can park and, 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 and hike and fish the rest of the way up. I've done that a couple of times, probably at my age, won't ever do that again. Uh, but I'm glad I did it a couple of times because it was quite an experience. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the, the format of what those creeks look like. This is typical size. Uh, this is a pretty open area. Um, this is Courthouse Falls, Courthouse Creek Falls, pretty famous water. It's the biggest waterfall on this creek. Although there are other waterfalls, this is the biggest one. This is about a 25, maybe 30. I've heard some people describe this as a 50 foot water. This is not a 50 foot waterfall. It's about a 30 foot waterfall. The, the, the pool at the bottom here, um, uh, if you want to recharge your batteries, 
uh, you know, jump in this sucker and take a swim in it because it is, it's probably 10 or 15 feet deep, crystal clear most of the time. It's somewhat occluded right now after a little rain, but it is a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, just look at the greenery and the moss. Uh, this is not really an enhanced image, uh, overly enhanced in any way, but the, the late afternoon colors, uh, that's what you get. It's just a fabulous place. Uh, whoop, there's one of those little brook trout uh, hangs around up there. Uh, beautiful colors, beautiful blue haze around that red uh, mustard color right there. Very pretty fish. Uh, here's the upper part as you get above uh, the falls, get past the road and get into some of the areas. Here's another uh, little brook trout um, that uh, on a on a on a ant pattern here, bigger than his mouth. I don't know how he gets his mouth around something like that. Uh, generally speaking, uh, this creek, I fished it maybe three times. Uh, I think it's a carbon copy of Courthouse Creek, other than it's a little bit smaller, it's a little shorter, uh, it's about the same gradient. Uh, you're not going to find anyone on this creek. Um, and the only thing I caught on it was rainbows. There's several little, little waterfalls on this Creek, uh, that form little stair step waterfalls that you can see got to be kind of dangerous, uh, kind of tough, difficult to get around them without crawling over them. And I've, I've not had a good history of doing those kind of things. Uh, but in either event, uh, uh, there's one plus decent, uh, here's uh, this is more typical of, of what you'll see the little drop pools that you'll see and uh, probably more typical of the little trout um, that you'll catch on on these upper headwaters of the north fork of the French broad and that's about I think this may be my last image um, that was shot this is either courthouse or Kissimmee I don't I don't know it's one or the other but um, that's about all I've got that I can think of that I can say off the top of my head about these about this river. I think it's a very special river for a lot of reasons. I hope you, you think it is too, after maybe listening to some of what I've had to say about it. I would encourage you, um, if you fish it, uh, you fish the middle portions of it, hire yourself a guide. Uh, and, and I'm not a guide, by the way. But hire, hire a real guide. There are a lot of guides in the area that would love to take you up there and, and show you how and where to fish the area uh, and get the most out of it. And uh, I think you'll really, really enjoy it.